Hey everyone, I'm starting a a series on history just because after listening to Paul Talk's history episodes it's made me realise that I've neglected to research history just because it's been so confusing and there's been so much propaganda. Um, I'm going to read about Antifa to start off with Basically just reading the Wikipedia article, starting with Antifascistische Aktion, which is German. This article is about the historical German organization in the Weimar Republic for the wider movement it inspired the Antifa, brackets Germany. So there's a picture of the red anti-fascistisch action flags in a circle with Herr Zuun's Come to Us poster. And then there's a picture of the 1932 Unity Congress of the anti-fascistisch action in the centre. The Antifa logo flanked by Soviet banners to the right imagery of the Cape PD fighting capitalism to the left imagery attacking the SPD. Anti-fascistische Aktion, commonly known under its abbreviation Antifa, was a militant anti-fascist organization in the Weimar Republic started by members of the Communist Party of Germany. KPD, that existed from 1932 to 1933. It was primarily active as a KPD campaign during the 1932 elections and was described by the KPD as a red united front under the leadership of the only anti-fascist party, the KPD. Under the leadership of the committed Stalinist Ernst Thalmann, The KPD viewed fascism primarily as the final stage of capitalism rather than as a specific movement or group and therefore applied the term to all other parties. The front focused largely on attacking the KPD's main adversary, the centre-left Social Democratic Party of Germany, whom they referred to as social fascists and regarded as the main pillar of the dictatorship of capital. In the post-war era, the historical organisation inspired new groups and networks known as the wider Antifa movement, many of which use the aesthetics of the historical anti-fascistische action, especially its abbreviated name Antifa and a modified version of its logo. During the Cold War, the Anti-fascistische Aktion had a dual legacy in East Germany and West Germany. Respectively, in the East, it was considered part of the history and heritage of the KPD's successor, the East German Communist Party. In the West, its aesthetics and name were embraced by West German Maoists and later autonomists from the 1970s. Background The picture, under the leadership of Ernst Thalmann, the KPD had become a fiercely Stalinist party and viewed the Social Democratic Party as both its main adversary and as social fascists. As leader of the KPD, Thalmann founded Antifa in 1932. The late 1920s and early 1930s saw rising tensions mainly between three broad groups, the Communist Party of Germany, KPD, on one side, the Nazi Party on another another side, and a coalition of governing parties, mainly Social Democrats and Liberals, on the other side. Berlin, in particular, was the site of regular and often very violent clashes. Both the Communists and the Nazis explicitly sought to overthrow the liberal democracy of the Weimar Republic. 
while the Social Democrats and Liberals strongly defended the Republic and its constitution. As part of this struggle, all three factions organized their own paramilitary groups. Under the leadership of Ernst Thälmann, the KPD became a Stalinist party that was fiercely loyal to the Soviet government. And since 1928, the KPD was largely controlled and funded by the Soviet government through Comintern. Up until 1928, the KPD pursued an, a united front policy of working with other working class and socialist parties to combat fascism. It was in this period that the Rota Frontkampfverbund, the KPD's first anti-fascist front, was formed. However, after the Comintern's abrupt ultra-left turn in its third period from 1928, the KPD regarded the Social Democratic Party of Germany, the SPD, as its main adversary, and the KPD adopted the position that the SPD was the main fascist party in Germany. This was based on the theory of social fascism that had been proclaimed by Stalin and that was supported by the Comintern during the late 1920s and early 1930s and that held that social democracy was a variant of fascism and even the most insidious form of fascism. Consequently, the KPD held that it was the only anti-fascist party in Germany and stated that fighting fascism means fighting the SPD just as much as it means fighting Hitler and bringing and the parties of Brüning. In the usage of the Soviet Union, the Comintern and its affiliated parties, including the KPD, the epithet fascist was used from the 1920s to describe capitalist society in general and virtually any anti-Soviet or anti-communist activity or opinion. The term anti-fascist became ubiquitous in Soviet Comintern and KPD usage where it became synonymous with the Communist Party line. In KPD and Soviet usage, fascism was primarily viewed as the final stage of capitalism, rather than a specific group or movement such as the Italian fascists or the German National Socialists, and based on this theory, the term was applied very broadly. The KPD's paramilitary and propaganda organisation the Rota Front Kampfverbund, Red Front Fighters League, or RFB, had been formed in 1924 and was often involved in violent clashes with the police. In 1929, the Red Front was banned as extremists by the governing Social Democrats. After rallies escalated on Tag in Berlin, 33 people were killed and many injured in the confrontations between police and protesters. May the 1st, 1929, was the bloodiest Mayfeiertag in Germany, in German history. In 1930, the KPD established its de facto successor, the Kampfbund gegen den Fascismus, fighting alliance against fascism. In late 1931, the local Rotor Massen Red mass self-defense RMSSS units were formed by Kampfbund members as autonomous and loosely organized structures under the leadership of but outside the formal organization of the KPD as part of the party's united front policy to work with other working class groups to defeat fascism as interpreted by the party. The KPD viewed the Nazi party ambiguously during the early 1930s. On the one hand, the KPD considered the Nazi party to be one of the fascist parties, albeit a lesser evil than the SPD. On the other hand, the KPD sought to appeal to the left wing of the Nazi movement by using nationalist slogans. The KPD sometimes cooperated with the Nazis in attacking the Social Democrats. In 1931, the KPD had united with the Nazis, whom they referred to as working people's comrades in an unsuccessful attempt to bring down the Social Democrat state government of Prussia by means of a referendum. The formation of 
anti-fascistische Aktion in 1932 indicated a shift away from the third period policies as fascism was recognized as a more serious threat leading up to the 1934-35 adoption of a popular front policy of anti-fascist unity with non-communist groups. In October 1931, a coalition of right-wing and far-right-wing parties had established the Haasberg Front that opposed the government of the centre parties, Heinrich Brüning. In response, the Social Democrats and affiliated groups had established the Iron Front that sought to defend liberal democracy and the constitution of the Weimar Republic. Anti-fascistische Aktion was formed partly as a counter-move to the Social Democrats' establishment of the Iron Front, which the KPD regarded as a social fascist terror organisation. The establishment of Antifa. There's a picture with Karl Liebknecht House the KPD's headquarters from 1926 to 1933, the anti-fascistische Aktion, aka Antifa logo, can be seen prominently displayed on the front of the building. After a brawl in the Landtag of Prussia between members of the Nazi Party and Communists left eight people se- severely injured, the KPD, under Talman's leadership, reacted to the establishment of the Haasberg Front and the Iron Front with a call for their own Unity Front, which they shortly after renamed the Anti-Fascistische Aktion. The KPD formally announced the establishment of Anti-Fascistische Aktion in the party's newspaper, Die Rot Fein, the Red Flag, on 26 of May 1932. The new organisation was based on the principle of a communist front, but it remained an integral part of the KPD, the KPD described anti-fascistische action as a red united front under the leadership of the only anti-fascist party, the KPD. According to Langer, the anti-fascistische action was largely a counter move to the Social Democrats' Iron Front. An election poster of the SPD from 1932 with three arrows symbol representing resistance against reactionary conservatism, Nazism and communism, and with the slogan against Papen Hitler Thalmann. The organization held its first rally in Berlin on 10 July 1932, then capital of Weimar Republic. Its two-flag logo designed by the Association of Revolutionary Visual Artists. Members Max Kilsen and Max Gebhard remains a widely used symbol of militant anti-fascism. How many people belonged to the anti-fascistish action is difficult to determine because there were no membership cards. Rather, the anti-fascistish action developed out of the practical participation. The RMSS units were absorbed into anti-fascistish action, forming the nuclei of the latter's unity committees, organised on a micro-local basis, e.g. in apartment buildings, factories or allotments. As well as being involved in political street fights, the RMSS and anti-fascistish action used their militant approach to develop a comprehensive network of self-defense for communist communities targeted by the Nazis, for example, in tenant protection, mitre shoots, action against evictions. Initially, the RMSS units had minimal formal membership, but in the second half of 1932, Local executive boards were created to coordinate the activities of the KPD, Kampfbund, RMSS and now illegal RFB with the RMSS given a more distinct and almost paramilitary defence role, often cooperating on an ad hoc basis with the Reichsbanner. With the anti-fascistische action, the KPD not only wanted to create a cross-party collection movement dominated by KPD, but they also aimed specifically at the Reichstag election on 31st of July 1932, 
the election campaign for the July election in 1932 is regarded as the most violent in German history, in particular between KPD and NSDAP supporters. It came to massive clashes and even shootings. After the forced dissolution in the wake of the Machtergreifung in 1933, the movement went underground. Legacy. In the post-war era, the historical anti-fascist action, in spite of a variety of different movements, groups and individuals in Germany as well as other countries which widely adopted variants of its aesthetics and some of its tactics. This is known as the wider Antifa movement. The modern Antifa groups have no direct organisational connection to the historical anti-fascist action. I'm going to click on Antifa. And um, they have the, the modern Antifa logo, which is based on the logo of the historical first incarnation, but in contrast to the original logo, with two red flags that represented communism and socialism, a black flag representing anarchism and autonomism was added in the 1980s. The Antifa movement in Germany is composed of multiple far-left autonomous militant groups and individuals who describe themselves as anti-fascist. According to the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution and the Federal Agency for Civic Education, the use of the epithet fascist against opponents and the understanding of capitalism as a form of fascism are central to the movement. The Antifa movement has existed in different eras and incarnations. The original organization called Antifa was the anti fascist Action 1932-33, set up by the then Stalinist Communist Party of Germany, KPD, during the late history of the Weimar Republic in the Soviet occupation zone and East Germany. The remnants of the first movement were absorbed into the ruling Communist Party and became part of its official apparatus, ideology and language, with anti-fascism understood primarily as an anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist ideology elevated to state doctrine of East Germany. The modern Antifa movement has its roots in the West German Aufruhrparlamentarische Opposition, left-wing student movement, and largely adopted the aesthetics of the first movement while being ideologically somewhat dissimilar. The first Antifa groups in this tradition were founded by the Maoist Communist League, part, uh, Communist League in the early 1970s. From the late 1980s, West Germany's squatter scene and left-wing autonomism movement were main contributors to the new Antifa movement and in contrast to the earlier movement had a more anarcho-communist leaning. The modern movement had splintered into different groups and factions, including one anti-imperialist and anti-Zionist faction and one anti-German faction who strongly opposed each other, mainly over their views on Israel. German government institutions like the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution and the Federal Agency for Civic Education describe the contemporary Antifa movement as part of the extreme left and as partially violent, and Antifa groups are monitored by the Federal Office in the context of its legal mandate to combat extremism. The Federal Office states that the underlying goal of the Antifa movement is the struggle against the liberal democratic basic order and capitalism. At times the movement has been accused by Germany, German authorities of engaging in terrorist acts of violence. Anti-fascistish action. The first organization known as Antifa was established by the Communist Party of Germany based on the principle of the Communist Front and its establishment was announced in the party's newspaper 
the red flag. As such, it functioned as an integral part of KPD during its entire existence. A member of the Comintern KPD under leadership of Ernst Talman was loyal to the Soviet government headed by Joseph Stalin to the extent that the party had been directly controlled and funded by the Soviet leadership in Moscow since 1928. The KPD described anti-fascistish action as a red united front under the leadership of the only anti-fascist party, the KPD. The KPD had proclaimed that it was the only anti-fascist party during the elections of 1930. The KPD did not view fascism as a specific po political movement, but primarily as a final stage of capitalism, and anti-fascism was therefore synonymous with anti-capitalism. Unlike the situation in Italy, no party regarded itself as fascist. In Weimar-era Germany, throughout the Weimar era, the KPD regarded the centre-left Social Democratic Party, SPD, as its main adversary. The KPD considered the SPD to be social fascist, based on a theory proclaimed by Stalin and supported by the Comintern in the early 1930s, according to which social democracy was a variant of fascism, and even more dangerous and insidious than open fascism. Talman took his instructions from Stalin, and his hatred of the SPD was essentially ideological. In his sympathetic history of the Antifa movement published by the Association for the Promotion of Anti-Fascist Culture, Bernd Langer notes that anti-fascism was always a fundamentally anti-capitalist strategy and that communists always took anti-fascism to mean anti-capitalism. Therefore, all other parties were fascist in the opinion of the KPD and especially the SPD. The KPD... Resolution, for instance, described the social fascists, social democrats, as the main pillar of the dictatorship of capital. Consequently, anti-fascism in the language of the KPD and its new activist wing, the anti-fascistish anti action, also included the struggle against the social democrats. The KPD had stated that fighting fascism means fighting the SPD just as much as it means fighting Hitler and parties of Brüning. Occasionally, the Communist Party cooperated with the Nazis in attacking the Social Democrats and both sought to destroy the liberal democracy of the Weimar Republic. While also, opposing to the, while also opposed to the Nazis, the KPD regarded the Nazi Party as a less sophisticated and thus less dangerous fascist party than the SPD and KPD leader Ernst Thälmann declared in December 1931 that some Nazi trees must not be allowed to overshadow a forest of social democrats. The relationship between the KPD and the SPD was characterised by mutual hostility. The SPD had itself adopted the position that both the Nazis and the Communists posed an equal danger to liberal democracy. And social democrat leader Kurt Schumacher famously described the Communists as red-painted Nazis in 1930. The social democrat dominated Reichsbanger Schwarzrott Gold described itself as a protection organization of the Republic and democracy in the fight against the swastika and the Soviet star. And both the Reichsbanner and the Iron Front op opposed both the Nazis and the anti-fascist communists. In 1929, the KPD's paramilitary organization the Rota Front Kampfverband, Alliance of Red Front Fighters, an effective predecessor of the later anti-fascistish action, had been banned as extremists by the governing Social Democrats. In December 1929, the KPD founded the anti-fascistish Jungard as a successor to the banned Rota Front Kampfverband. The 1932 Antifa Congress organized by KPD was in large part dedicated to attacking the SPD. It featured a large Antifa logo flanked by imagery that showed the KPD fighting the capitalists, next to imagery openly mocking the SPD. The KPD continued to deny any essential difference between Nazism and social democracy even after the elections of 1933. And under the leadership of Ernst Talman, the KPD coined the slogan 
after Hitler, our turn. Strongly believing that a united front against Nazis was not needed and that a Nazi dictatorship would ultimately crumble due to flawed economic policies and lead the communists to power in Germany when the people realized that the communists' economic policies were superior. Theodore Draper argued that the so-called theory of social fascism and the practice based on it constituted one of the chief factors contributing to the victory of German fascism in January 1933. Central to the Antifa movement is the use of the epithet fascist. According to Norman Davies, the concept of anti-fascism originated as an ideological construct of the Soviet Union, where the epithets fascist and fascism were primarily and widely used to describe capitalist society in general and virtually any anti-Soviet or anti-Stalinist activity or opinion. This usage was also adopted by communist parties affiliated with the Comintern, such as the KPD. During the Comintern's third period, 1928-31, the Social Democrats SPD were included by the KPD in the category of fascists based on the theory of social fascism and the KPD doctrine that the Communist Party was the only anti-fascist party while all other parties were fascist and the KPD stated that fighting fascism means fighting the SPD just as much as it means fighting Hitler and the parties are burning. Cold War era use. Picture of the Berlin Wall was officially referred to as the anti-fascist protection wall by the East German communist regime. Second picture, East German military parade in, parade in eight, 1986, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the anti-fascist protection wall. After the defeat of Nazi Germany, local groups called anti-fascist committees were spontaneously formed in several cities and towns and consisted of, consisted of former members of communist parties such as the KPD and the KPO, some social democrats and some former members of other political parties and members of the confessing church. In the western zones, these committees began to recede by the late summer of 1945, marginalised by allied bans on political organisations by re-emerging divisions between communists and others and the emerging state doctrine of anti-communism in what became West Germany, while in East Germany, the Antifa groups were absorbed into the new Stalinist state. In the Soviet occupation zone, which later became East Germany, the Soviet occupation authorities pressured the Communist Party and the remaining Social Democrats to merge into the Socialist Unity Party of Germany, while Social Democrats who resisted the Stalinization were persecuted and often fled to the Western zones. The repression in the Soviet occupation zone and the onset of the Cold War quickly exacerbated the conflict between the communists and the social democrats, and the term anti-fascism was used by the communists to smear their opponents, including social democrats. In communist East Germany, anti-fascism, as interpreted with, within the communist movement, was part of the official ideology and language of the communist state, and the original anti-fascistish action was considered an important part of the heritage of the governing Socialist Unity Party of Germany along with the Communist Party of Germany itself. Eckhard Jesse notes that the term anti-fascism was ubiquitous in the language of the East German Communist Party and used to justify repression such as the crackdown on East German uprising of 1953. Anti-fascism in East Germany generally meant the struggle against the Western world and NATO in general, and against the Western-backed Federal Republic of Germany and its main ally, the United States in particular, which was seen as the main fascist forces in the world by the East German Communist Party. For example, from 1961 to 1989, the East German Socialist Unity Party used the term anti-fascist protection wall. German anti-fascista 
Schutzwall, and the official name for the Berlin Wall, in sharp contrast to the West Berlin city government, which would sometimes refer to the same structure as the Wall of Shame. In East Germany, the anti-Zionist struggle was seen as an important part of the anti-fascist struggle, and Israel was regarded by the East German regime as a fascist state, alongside the United States and West Germany. Jeffrey Herf argues that East Germany was waging an undeclared war on Israel, and that East Germany played a salient role in the Soviet bloc's antagonism toward Israel. After becoming a member of the UN, according to Jeffrey Herf, East Germany made excellent use of the UN to wage political warfare against Israel and was an enthusiastic, high-profile and vigorous member of the anti-Israel majority of the General Assembly. Anti-fascism, as interpreted by the German communists, served as a legitimizing ideology and state doctrine of the East German communist regime. When the communist regime crumbled during the revolutions of 1989, the East German Communist Party intensified its use of anti-fascist rhetoric directed at the West to justify its existence. Modern Antifa Groups The modern Antifa movement in Germany comprises different far-left autonomous militant groups and individuals who describe themselves as anti-fascist and usually use the abbreviation Antifa and who regard the historical anti-fascist action or Antifa of the early 1930s as an inspiration. The modern Antifa movement ultimately has its origins in the student-based extra-parliamentary opposition of the 1960s and early 70s and opposed the alleged fascism of West German government. The earliest modern Antifa groups in this tradition were founded by the Maoist Communist League in the early 1970s. During the 70s, parts of the Alfred Parliamentary opposition were radicalised, culminating culminating in the formation of terrorist groups like the Red Army Faction, the 2nd of June Movement, and the Revolutionary Cells. Some of the more radical elements within Antifa groups of the late 1970s had contact with the Red Army Faction and the Revolutionary Cells. From the late 1980s, the squatter scene and autonomism movement were important in an upswing of the Antifa movement. Unlike the original anti-fascist action which had links to the Communist Party of Germany and which was concerned with industrial working class politics, the late 1980s and early 1990s autonomous were instead independent anti-authoritarian, libertarian Marxists and anarcho-communists not associated with any particular party. The publication of anti-fascistisches Infoblatt in operations since 1987, sought to expose radical nationalists publicly. In 2003, Anti-Fascistisches Infoblatt joined Antifa Net, part of an international network, including the likes of Britain's Searchlight and Sweden's Expo magazine. Most modern Antifa groups were formed after the German reunification in 1990, mainly in the early part of the 1990s. For example, the Autonome Antifa was established in Göttingen in 1990. The Antifascistische Action Berlin, founded in 1993, became one of the more prominent groups. The Antifascistische Action Bundesweit Organisation was an umbrella organisation at the federal level that coordinated these groups across Germany. Aside from their violent clashes with ultra-nationalists, these groups participated in the annual May Day in Kreuzberg, which resulted in large-scale riots in 1987 and which had been characterised by significant police presence. 
Stephen Callitz notes that the difference between the autonomous scene and terrorist networks gradually lost importance from the 1990s and that a number of Antifa groups were involved in violent activities from the 1990s. Antifa was linked to the rights during the 2017 G20 Hamburg summit. Main factions and ideology. The picture of protesters belonging to anti-German wing of Antifa, carrying the slogan down with Germany slash solidarity with Israel slash for communism with Antifa logo. The German Antifa movement gradually fractured into three main camps after German reunification. One, anti-imperialist Antifa, the largest group who most closely adhere to the traditional position taken within the movement and communist parties generally, and who thus tend to view politics in terms of how a country relates to the West and who see anti-Zionism as part of the anti-fascist struggle. Two, anti-Germans, who emphasise their opposition to Germany as a country, who support Israel and who oppose the anti-imperialists and the mainstream left. Three, those that have no opposition on Israel or who see it as irrelevant to questions of contemporary anti-fascism in Germany. Diverging opinions on Israel has caused a split in this movement since the 2000s. As a result of this, the anti-fascistische action Bundesweit organization dissolved in 2001 and it splintered into different groups and factions as a result of these political differences. Many contemporary Antifa groups include their understanding of various forms of oppression or general and loosely defined topics such as war, sexism, racism or homophobia in their understanding of fascism. Frequently corporate interests, the government and especially the police and military are also included in their understanding of fascism. In German, the terms Antifa and anti-fascism are often used interchangeably, according to political scientist and CDU politician Tim Peters, usage of the term anti-fascism in contemporary Germany is mainly limited to the far left, while the term and ideology are viewed critically by many. For instance, political scientist Antonia Grunenberg describes anti-fascism as a strange term that expresses opposition to something but no political concept, and points out that while all Democrats are against anti-fascism, not everyone who is against fascism is a Democrat. In this sense, Grunenberg argues that the term obscures the difference between Democrats and non-Democrats. Symbolism. Picture of German Antifa protesters with a banner reading Red and Anarchist, Skinheads Hanover, as long as you don't resist, you're supporting the system. Many modern Antifa groups have adopted variants of the aesthetic of the original Antifa movement of 32 to 33. Most use a modified variant of its logo originally designed by Max Gebhard and Max Kielsen for the Communist Party of Germany. Sometimes the name of the historical organization is also included on banners and other imagery. Although it does not form an extant organization, while the original logo of anti-fascistische action featured two red flags representing communism and socialism, modern Antifa logos in the 1980s usually feature a black flag representing anarchism and autonomism in addition to the red flag. Government and police monitoring and prosecution of Antifa. German government institutions like the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution and the Federal Agency for Civic Education describe the contemporary Antifa movement as part of the extreme left. And Antifa movements, Antifa groups are monitored by the Federal Office in the context of its legal mandate to combat extremism under the provisions allowed by the German system of a Streitbeer Demokratie, fortified democracy. 
The Federal Agency for Civic Education notes that Antifa groups sometimes call for violence, not only against police or skinheads, but also against bishops and judges. There are slogans like anti-fascism means attack, not only against the far right, but also against the political system of the Federal Republic of Germany. Writing for the Federal Agency for Civic Education, extremism expert Armin Fall Trauber, a former director within the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution, notes that even if every convinced Democrat is an opponent of fascism, anti-fascism is not per se a democratic position. One must, according to Fall Trauber, distinguish between fascism in a scholarly sense and fascism in a far-left extremist sense. The Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution describes the field of anti-fascism or Antifa as extremist and includes it and associated groups in its annual public reports on extremism as part of the topic far-left extremism. The Federal Office notes that The field of anti-fascism has for years been a central element of the political activity of far-left extremists, especially violent ones. Far-left extremists within this tradition only superficially claim to fight far-right activities. In reality, the focus is the struggle against the liberal democratic basic order, which is smeared as a capitalist system with fascist roots from the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution. The modern Antifa or anti-fascist movement in the Federal Republic of Germany has been mentioned in the annual report on the protection of the Constitution since 1986 as part of the main chapter on far-left extremism and was described as a group engaged in terrorist acts of violence. In 1995, public prosecutors in Lower Saxony charged 17 members of Antifa with belonging to a criminal organisation and with supporting terrorism as part of a sweeping investigation into Antifa by Lower Saxon police and security agencies known as the Anti-Antifa investigation that started in 1991. The case was dropped in 1996. A report by the German Bundestag from 2018 determined that due to the lack of a formal organisational structure or leadership, it is only possible to prosecute members of Antifa on terrorism charges in individual cases. Now I'm going to read the section on Antifa in the United States. Antifa is a predominantly left-wing, anti-fascist, political activist movement in the United States, comprising a diverse array of autonomous groups that aim to achieve their objectives through the use of direct action rather than through policy reform. Antifa activists engage in protest tactics such as digital activism and militancy, sometimes involving property damage, physical violence and harassment, against fascists, racists, and those on the far right. Individuals involved in the movement tend to hold anti-authoritarian and anti-capitalist views, subscribing to a range of left-wing ideologies such as anarchism, communism, Marxism, social democracy, and socialism. Both the name Antifa and the logo with two flags representing anarchism and communism are derived from the German Antifa movement. The English word Antifa is a loan word from German taken as a shortened form of the word antifascistisch, antifascist, and the name of antifascistisch action, which inspired the wider Antifa movement in Germany. Oxford Dictionaries place Antifa on its short list for Word of the Year in 2017 and stated the word emerged from a relative obscurity to become an established part of the English lexicon over the course of 2017. The Anti-Defamation League makes a point that the label Antifa should be limited to those who proactively seek physical confrontations with their perceived fascist adversaries and not be misapplied 
to include all anti-fascist counter-protesters. So those who proactively seek physical confrontations with their perceived fascist adversaries and not be misapplied to all anti-fascist counter-protesters. So I think the word there was physical confrontations, proactively seeking. Ideology. Individuals involved in the movement tend to hold anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist and anti-government views, subscribing to a range of left-wing ideologies. A majority of adherents are anarchists, communists and other socialists, who describe themselves as revolutionaries, although some social democrats and other leftists adhere to the Antifa movement. The movement is a pan-leftist and non-hierarchical, meaning, I mean, being united by opposition to right-wing extremism and white supremacy, as well as opposition to a centralised state. Antifa activists reject anti-fascist conservatives, as well as liberals. The movement issues mainstream liberal democracy and electoral politics in favour of direct action. Despite the movement's opposition to liberalism, right-wing commentators have accused Antifa adherents of supporting liberalism and being aided by liberal sympathisers. The Anti-Defamation League states that most Antifa come from the anarchist movement or from the far left though since the 2016 presidential election, some people with more mainstream political backgrounds have also joined their ranks. Similarly, ABC notes that while Antifa's political leanings are often described as far left, experts say members' radical views vary and can intersect with communism, socialism and anarchism. According to CNN, the term Antifa is used to define a broad group of people whose political beliefs lean toward the left, often the far left, but do not conform with the Democratic Party platform. On the other hand, the BBC reports how, as their name indicates, Antifa focuses more on fighting far-right ideology than encouraging pro-left policy. Movement structure. Antifa is not a unified organisation, but rather a movement without a hierarchical leadership structure, comprising multiple autonomous groups and individuals. The movement is loosely affiliated and has no chain of command, with Antifa groups instead sharing resources and information about far-right activity across regional and national borders through loosely knit networks and informal relationships of trust and solidarity. According to Mark Bray, members hide their political activities from law enforcement and the far-right and concerns about infiltration and high expectations of commitment keep the sizes of groups rather small. Activists typically organise protests via social media and through websites. Some activists have built peer-to-peer networks or use encrypted texting services like Signal. Chauncey de Vega of Salon described Antifa as an organising strategy, not a group of people. The Antifa movement has grown since the 2016 United States presidential election. As of August 2017, approximately 200 groups existed of varying sizes and levels of activity. History. When Italian dictator Benito Mussolini consolidated power under his National Fascist Party in the mid-1920s, an oppositional anti-fascist movement surfaced both in Italy and countries such as the United States. Many anti-fascist leaders in the United States were anarchist, socialist and syndicalist emigres from Italy with experience in labour organising and militancy. Ideologically, Antifa in the United States sees itself as the successor to anti-Nazi activities of the 1930s. European activist groups that originally organised to oppose, oppose World War II era fascist dictatorships re-emerged in the 1970s and 1980s to oppose white supremacy and skinheads, eventually spreading to the United States 
after World War II and prior to the development of the modern Antifa movement, violent confrontations with fascist elements continued sporadically. Modern Antifa politics can be traced to opposition to the infiltration of Britain's punk scene by white power skinheads in the 1970s and 80s and the emergence of neo-Nazism in Germany following the fall of the Berlin Wall. In Germany, young leftists, including anarchists and punk fans, renewed the practice of street-level anti-fascism. Columnist Peter Beinart writes that in late 80s left-wing punk fans in the United States began following suit, though they initially called their group's anti-racist action, ARA, on the theory that Americans would be more familiar with fighting racism than they would be with fighting fascism. Dartmouth College historian Mark Bray, author of Antifa, the Anti-Fascist Handbook, credits the ARA as the precursor of modern Antifa groups in the United States. In the late 1980s and 90s, ARA activists toured with popular punk rock and skinhead bands in order to prevent Klansmen, neo-Nazis and other assorted white supremacists from recruiting. Their motto was, We Go Where They Go, by which they meant they would confront far-right activists in concerts and actively remove their materials from public places. In 2002, the ARA disrupted a speech in Pennsylvania by Matthew F. Hale, the head of the white supremacist group World Church of the Creator, resulting in a fight and 25 arrests. One of the earliest Antifa groups in the United States was Roy City Antifa, which was formed in Portland, Oregon in 2007. Other Antifa groups in the United States have other genealogies. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, a group called the Baldies was formed in 1987 with the intent to fight neo-Nazi groups directly. During the George Floyd protests in May and June 2020, there have been repeated calls from President Donald Trump, Attorney General William Barr and others to designate Antifa as a terrorist organisation. However, Mark Bray argues that Antifa cannot be designated as a terrorist organisation because the groups are loosely organised and they aren't large enough to cause everything Trump blames them for. In addition, Bray notes how the right wing has attempted to blame everything on Antifa during the George Floyd protests and that in assuming Antifa to be predominantly white, it evinces a kind of racism that assumes that black people couldn't organise on this deep and wide of a scale. In June 2020, conservative journalist Andy Ngo, whom Rolling Stone has described as a right-wing provocateur and Vox called a far-right sympathiser, who doxed at least one Antifa activist by publishing her full name, sued Antifa seeking $900,000 in damages for assault and emotional distress and an injunction to prevent further harassment. The lawsuit filed on Ngo's behalf by his attorney Hamid Tilon cites Rose City Antifa, five other named defendants and additional unknown assailants. It stems from multiple alleged attacks on Ngo in Portland during 2019 and accuses Rose City Antifa in particular of a pattern of racketeering activities. Activities. According to historian and Rutgers University lecturer Mark Bray, an expert on the movement, the vast majority of anti-fascist organising is non-violent, but their willingness to physically defend themselves and others from white supremacist violence and preemptively shut down fascist organising efforts before they turn deadly distinguishes them from liberal anti-racists. According to Brian Levin, director of the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at the California State University, San Bernardino, Antifa activists feel the need to participate in violent actions because they believe that elites are controlling the government and the media, so they need to make a statement head-on against the people who they regard as racist. Mark Bray wrote that the adherents rejecting 
reject turning to the police or the state to halt the advance of white supremacy. Instead, they advocate popular opposition to fascism, as we witnessed in Charlottesville. The idea of direct action is central to the Antifa movement, former Antifa organiser Scott Crow told an interviewer. The idea in Antifa is that we go where they right-wingers go. That hate speech is not free speech. That if you are endangering people with what you say and the actions that are behind them, then you do not have the right to do that. And so we go to cause conflict, to shut them down where they are because we don't believe that Nazis or fascists of any stripe should have a mouthpiece. A manual posted on It's Going Down, an anarchist website, warns against accepting people who just want to fight. It furthermore notes that physically confronting and defending against fascists is a a necessary part of anti-fascist work, but is not the only or even necessarily the most important part. The picture of Rose City Antifa activists with modified anarchist red and black flag and transgender pride flag in a protest against Patriot Prayer in 2017. According to Beinart, Antifa activists try to publicly identify white supremacists and get them fired from their jobs and evicted from their apartments and also disrupt white supremacist rallies, including by force. A Washington Post book review reports Antifa tactics include no platforming, i.e. denying their targets the opportunity to speak out in public, obstructing their events and defacing their propaganda, and when Antifa activists deem it necessarily necessary, deploying violence to deter them. According to National Public Radio, Antifa's approach is confrontational, and people who speak for the Antifa movement acknowledge they sometimes carry clubs and sticks. CNN describes Antifa as known for causing damage to property during protests. Scott Crow says that Antifa adherents believe that property destruction does not equate to violence, According to the Los Angeles Times, they have engaged in mob violence attacking a small showing of supporters of President Trump and others they accused, sometimes inaccurately, of being white supremacists or Nazis. Antifa activists used clubs and dyed liquids against white supremacists in Charlottesville. According to the Kansas City Star, Kansas City Police told Antifa members to remove ammunition from their firearms at a rally Saturday in Washington Square Park. The far-right militia movement, Three Percenters, who were carrying firearms at the rally in 2017, were also approached by police. Apart from the other activities, Antifa activists engage in mutual aid such as disaster response in the case of Hurricane Harvey. According to Natasha Leonard in The Nation, Antifa groups as of January 2017 were working with interfaith groups and churches to create a new sanctuary movement, continuing and expanding a 40-year-old practice of providing spaces for refugees and immigrants. Antifa activists also conduct research to monitor far-right activity, hold conferences and workshops on anti-fascist activism distribute literature at book fairs and film festivals, as well as avoiding ways of fostering sustainable, as advocating ways of fostering sustainable, peaceful communities, such as working in neighborhood gardens. And Antifa activists often use the black block tactic in which people dress in black and cover their faces in order to thwart surveillance and create a sense of equality and solidarity among participants. Antifa activists wear masks to hide their identity from protesters on the other side who might dox people they disagree with or from police and cameras and for philosophical reasons such as the belief that hierarchies are bad and that remaining anonymous helps keep one's ego in check. Joseph Bernstein from BuzzFeed News says Antifa activists also wear masks because they fear retribution from the far right and the cops 
whom they believe are sympathetic, if not outright supportive, to fascists. Notable actions. Antifa groups, along with black bloc activists, were among those who protested the 2016 election of Donald Trump. They also participated in the February 2017 Berkeley protests against alt-right provocateur speaker Milo Yiannopoulos, where they gained mainstream attention. With media reporting them throwing Molotov cocktails and smashing windows and causing $100,000 worth of damage. In April 2017, the Direct Action Alliance and the Oregon Students Empowered, described as two self-described anti-fascist groups, threatened to disrupt the 82nd Avenue of Roses Parade in Portland, Oregon, after hearing that the Multnomah County Republican Party would participate. The parade organisers also received an anonymous email reading you have seen how much power we have downtown and that the police cannot stop us from shutting, shutting down roads, so please consider your decision wisely. The two groups denied having anything to do with the email. The parade was ultimately cancelled by the organisers due to safety concerns. On June 15, 2017, some Antifa groups joined protesters at Evergreen State College to oppose the far-right group Patriot Prayers event. Patriot Prayer was supporting biology professor Brett Weinstein, who became the central figure in a controversy after he criticised changes to one of the college's events, in addition to peaceful Antifa activists who held up a community love sign. USA Today reported that one slashed the tyres of a far-right activist, Joey Gibson, and another was wrestled to the ground by Patriot Prayer activists after being seen with a knife. In August 2017, Antifa counter-protesters at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, reported the, Un- reported the New York Times, used clubs and dyed liquids against the white supremacists. Journalist Adele Stan interviewed an Antifa protester at the rally who said the sticks carried by the protesters were a justifiable countermeasure to the fact that the right has a goon squad. Some Antifa participants at the Charlottesville rally chanted that counter-protesters should punch a Nazi in the mouth. Antifa participants also protected Cornell West and various clergy from attack by white supremacists, with West stating he felt that Antifa had saved his life. Antifa activists also defended the First United Methodist Church, where the Charlottesville Clergy Collective provided refreshments, music and training to the counter-protesters. According to a local rabbi, they chased the white supremacists off with sticks. Groups that had been preparing to protest the Boston Free Speech Rally saw their plans become viral following the violence in Charlottesville. The eventually largely peaceful crowd of 40,000 counter-protesters in the Atlantic, McKay Coppins, stated that the 33 people arrested for violent incidents were mostly egged on by the minority of Antifa agitators in the crowd. President Trump described the protesters outside his August 2017 rally in Phoenix, Arizona as Antifa. Portland's police police chief said that anti-fascist and anarchist protesters at a June 2017 event in downtown parks in Portland, Oregon launched objects at police using slingshots, protesters and the American Civil Liberties Union criticised the Portland Police Department's use of crowd control weapons, saying it was disproportionate to the behaviour of a handful of Antifa protests in the crowd. During a Berkeley protest on August 27, 2017, an estimated 100 Antifa protesters joined a crowd of two to 4,000 other protesters to confront alt-right demonstrators and Trump supporters who showed up for a Say No to Marxism rally that had been cancelled by organisers due to security concerns. Protesters threatened to smash the cameras of anyone who filmed them. Jesse Ereguin, the mayor of Berkeley, suggested classifying the city's Antifa as a gang. The far-right group Patriot Prayer cancelled an event in San Francisco the same day following counter-protests. Joey Gibson, the founder of Patriot Prayer, 
blamed Antifa along with by any means necessary for breaking up the event. On January 20, 2018, Antifa protested a Night for Freedom hosted by far-right social media personality Mike Cernovich at the nightclub Freak in Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan. Protesters attacked partygoers spilling out of the venue, including a 56-year-old man taken to Bellevue Hospital in stable condition after allegedly being choked and punched. David Campbell, aged 32, subsequently pleaded guilty to two counts of felony assault for his role in the violence and was sentenced to 18 months in jail. In June 2018, a Nebraska Antifa group published a list of names and photographs of 1595 immigration and Customs Enforcement ICE officials drawn from LinkedIn profiles. In November 2018, police investigated the Antifa group Smash Racism DC following a protest outside the home of the Daily Caller founder Tucker Carlson, who has been described by the Associated Press as a major supporter of President Donald Trump and his policies. Activists of the group said through a bullhorn that Carlson was promoting hate Enchanted, we will fight, we know where you sleep at night, and deface the driveway of Carlson's property by spray painting an anarchist symbol on it. Twitter suspended the group's account for violation of Twitter rules by posting Carlson's home address. The group also posted addresses of Carlson's brother and a friend who co-founded the Daily Caller. In February 2019, anti-fascist activists marched in celebration through Stone Mountain, Georgia, as a white supremacist near Confederate rally planned to be held at the adjacent Stone Mountain Park was cancelled due to infighting and fear of personal safety. White supremacist groups originally sought to attract attention by marching at the Stone Mountain, a Confederate landmark carving during Super Bowl weekend. The groups ignored the park's denial of permit due to clear and present danger to the public health or safety. But this was thwarted, thwarted when Facebook and Twitter terminated their organising accounts and pages and by one group leaders retreat due to fears of violence from counter-protesters. In their absence, more than 100 Antifa activists marched peacefully through the adjacent village, burned a clansman effigy and chanted slogans such as Good night, all right, and death to the clan, before joining another civil rights rally at Piedmont Park held by the NAACP and the SPLC. Response from law enforcement and government officials. In June 2017, the Antifa movement was linked to anarchist extremism by the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. This assessment was replaced with one in 2019, which states that Antifa is a movement that focuses on issues involving racism, sexism and anti-Semitism, as well as other perceived injustices. The majority of Antifa members do not promote or endorse violence. However, the movement consists of anarchist extremists and other individuals who seek to carry out acts of violence in order to forward their respective agendas. On May 30th, 2020, at least a thousand protested protesters gathered in downtown Pittsburgh to demonstrate against the killing of George Floyd. Pittsburgh Police Chief Scott Schubert said that anarchists and Antifa were responsible for having hijacked that message and turned a peaceful protest into a a violent riot. Trump administration in August 2017, a petition was lodged with the White House petitioning system, We the People, calling upon President Donald Trump to formally classify Antifa as a terrorist. As a terrorist. The White House responded in 2018 that federal law does not have a mechanism of formally designating domestic terrorist organizations. The writer of the petition later stated he had created it <coughs> to bring our broken rights side together and to prop up Antifa as a punching bag. In September 2017, Politico obtained confidential documents and interviews indicating that in April 2016, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI believed that anarchist extremists were the the primary instigators of violence 
at public rallies against a range of targets. Politico interviewed unidentified law enforcement officials who noted a rise in activity since the beginning of the Trump administration, particularly a rise in recruitment and on the part of the far right as well, since the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally. One internal assessment acknowledged an inability to penetrate the group's diffuse and decentralized organizational structure. By 2017, the FBI and the DHS reported that they were monitoring suspicious Antifa activity in relation to terrorism. During the Trump administration, the term Antifa became a conservative catch-all term as Trump administration officials, Trump-based supporters and right-wing commentators applied the label to all sorts of left-leaning or liberal protest actions. Conservative writers such as L. Brent Bozell III labelled Black Lives Matter as Antifa. Politico reported that the term Antifa is a potent one for conservatives because it's the violent distillation of everything they fear could come to pass in an all-out culture war, and it's a quick way to brand part of the opposition. Alexander Reed Ross, who teaches at Portland State University, argued that the popularization of the term Antifa was a reaction to the popularization of the term alt-right, to the point where the word Antifa simply describes people who are anti-fascist or people who are against racism and are willing to protest against it. During the nationwide protests against the killing of George Floyd in May and June 2020, Attorney General William Barr blamed the violence on anarchic and far-left extremist groups using Antifa, using Antifa-like tactics. And President Trump tweeted that Antifa and the radical left were responsible. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien said the violence was being driven by Antifa, and Trump warned Antifa and other organisers of this terror to be on notice that you will face severe criminal penalties and lengthy sentences in jail. On May 31st, Barr issued a statement describing the actions of Antifa and other similar groups as domestic terrorism. And Trump tweeted that the United States of America will be designating Antifa as a terrorist organization. Since under existing law, the federal government may designate only foreign organizations as terrorists. The president has no authority to officially declare Antifa a terrorist group. Moreover, Antifa is a loosely associated movement rather than a specific organization. Legal experts believe designating Antifa as a terrorist group would be unconstitutional, raising First Amendment and due process issues. On June 2, The Nation published an internal situation report from the FBI's Washington field office stating it had no intelligence indicating Antifa involvement presence in the violent May 31 D.C. area protests. On June 4, Attorney, Attorney General Barr said, we have evidence that Antifa and other similar extremist groups, as well as actors of a variety of different political persuasions, have been involved in investigating and in instigating and participating in the violent activity. Also on June 4, FBI Director Christopher A. Ray stated that anarchists like Antifa are exploiting this situation to pursue violent extremist agendas. According to Mark Bray, while confident that some members of Antifa groups have participated in a variety of forms of resistance during the protests, he argues that it is impossible to ascertain the exact number of people who belong to Antifa groups. Reactions of others. Antifa actions have received criticism and praise from lawmakers and political commentators. Political commentators and members of Congress. Nancy Pelosi, the House Minority Leader for the Democratic Party, condemned the violence of Antifa activists in Berkeley on August 29, 2017. Talk show host and Fox News contributor Laura Ingraham suggested labelling Antifa as a terrorist organisation. In July 2019, Republican Senators Bill Cassidy and Ted Cruz introduced a non-binding resolution that would designate Antifa a domestic terrorist organisation. In June 2020, Republican Senator Tom Cotton 
advocated using military force to quell nationwide protests against police brutality and racism, calling for the 101st Airborne Division to be deployed to combat what he called Antifa terrorists. Senator Ted Cruz said, let's be clear, these Antifa protesters that are organising these acts of terror, among other things, they are behaving in a profoundly racist manner. Cruz called for systemic systematic law enforcement targeting Antifa and other terrorist groups. Civil rights organizations. According to the Anti-Defamation League, ADL, most established civil rights organizations criticize Antifa's tactics as dangerous and counterproductive. The ADL criticized Antifa for its use of unacceptable tactics such as violence and warned such tactics provided a powerful propaganda and recruitment tool to right-wing extremists. However, the ADL stated that it is important to reject attempts to claim equivalence between the Antifa and the white supremacist groups they oppose, noting that right-wing extremist movements are much more violent and have been responsible for hundreds of murders in the United States. While they have not been, while there have not been any known Antifa-related murders, academics and scholars, Dartmouth historian Mark Bray, who has studied the Antifa movement, has stated: given the historical and current threat that white supremacist and fascist groups pose, it's clear to me that organised collective self-defence is not only a legitimate response but lamentably an all too necessary response to this threat on too many occasions. Alexander Reed Ross, a lecturer in geography and an author on the contemporary right, has argued that Antifa groups represented one of the best models for channeling the popular reflexes and spontaneous movements towards confronting fascism in organised and focused ways. Eleanor Penny, an author on fascism and the far right, argues against Chomsky that physical resistance has time and again protected local populations from racist violence and prevented a gathering of caucus of fascists from making further inroads into mainstream politics. Cornell West, who attended a counter-protest to the Unite the Right rally, said in an interview that we would have been crushed like cockroaches if it were not for the anarchists and the anti-fascists, describing a situation where a group of 20 counter-protesters were surrounded by marchers whom he described as neo-fascists. Noam Chomsky described them as a major gift to the right. Other anti-anti-fascists on the left have argued that Antifa attack a symptom of liberal democracy rather than combating structural racism itself, and in doing so, distance themselves from revolutionary politics. Historian and dissident magazine editor Michael Kazin wrote, Non-leftists often see the left as a disruptive, lawless force. Violence tends to confirm that view. The historian Ruth ben Gatt argued that throwing a milkshake is not equivalent to killing someone, but because the people in power are allied with the right, any provocation, any dissent against right-wing violence backfires with the effect that militancy on the left can become a justification for those in power and allies on the right to crack down on the left. A section on hoaxes. Conspiracy theories about Antifa, which tend to... in accurately portray Antifa as a single organisation with leaders and secret sources of funding have been spread by right-wing activists, media organisations and politicians including Trump administration officials. There have been multiple efforts to discredit Antifa groups via hoaxes on social media, many of them false flag attacks originating from alt-right and 4chan protagonists posing as Antifa backers on Twitter. Some of these hoaxes have been picked up and reported as fact by right-leaning media. These include an August 27 hashtag punch white women photo hoax campaign spread by fake Antifa Twitter accounts 
In one such instance, Bellingcat researcher Elliot Higgins discovered an image of British actress Anna Friel portraying a battered woman in a 2007 Women's Aid anti-domestic violence campaign that had been repurposed using fake Antifa Twitter accounts organised by way of 4chan. The image is captioned, 53% of white women voted for Trump. 53% of white women should look like this and includes an Antifa flag. Another image featuring an injured woman is captioned, she chose to be a Nazi. Choices have consequences, and includes the hashtag punch a Nazi. Higgins remarked to the BBC that this was a transparent and quite pathetic attempt, but I wouldn't be surprised if white nationalist groups try to mount more sophisticated attacks in the future. A similar fake image circulated on social media after the Unite the Right rally in 2017. The doctored image actually from a 2009 riot in Athens was altered to make it look like someone wearing an Antifa symbol attacking a policeman with a flag. After the 2017 Las Vegas shooting, similar hoaxes falsely claimed that the shooter was an Antifa member. Another such hoax involved a fake Antifa Twitter account praising the shooting. Another high-profile fake Antifa account was banned from Twitter after it posted, with a geotag originating in Russia. Such fake Antifa accounts have been repeatedly reported on as real by right-leaning media outlets. On May 31st, 2020, at Antifa underscore US, a newly created Twitter account attempted to incite violence relating to the nationwide George Floyd protests against police brutality and racism. The next day, after determining that it was linked to the white nationalist group Identity Europa, spelt Evropa, Twitter suspended the fake account and FBI's Washington field office report stated that members of a far-right group on social media had called for far-right provocateurs to attack federal agents use automatic weapons against protesters during the D.C. area protests over Floyd's murder on May 31st, 2020. In June 2020, a multiracial family on a camping trip in Forks, Washington, were accused of being Antifa activists harassed and trapped in their campsite when trees were felled to block the road. In Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, groups of armed right-wing vigilantes occupied streets in response to false rumours that Antifa activists were planning to travel to the city, whilst rumours, while similar rumours led to threats being made against activists planning peaceful protests in Sonora, California. A study by Zignal Labs found that unsubstantiated claims of Antifa involvement were one of three dominant themes in misinformation and conspiracy theories around the protests, alongside claims that Floyd's death had been faked and claims of involvement by George Soros. Some of the opposition to Antifa activism has also been artificial in nature. Nafisa Saeed of Bloomberg reported that the most tweeted link in the Russian-linked network, followed by the researchers, was a petition to declare Antifa a terrorist group.